Make sure your Bibles are still open there to Luke 22. We're looking at lots of verses tonight, so just stay with me as we go. I'm afraid we make the Christian life sometimes too hard, too difficult to understand, too hard and too difficult to live through it. Really, if you get down to the very simplistic idea of it, living the Christian life is just a matter of faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. It's a life of walking in faith, believing God for what He said, and being just obedient to Him. But see, for our Christian life, we want some sort of pill, we want some sort of formula, we want some sort of training course, when really all we need is simple faith and believing what God tells us. So tonight we're looking at a term, and a term that applies to that is just reckon it to be so. Reckon it to be so. Back home we use that term a great deal. Well, I reckon. You're going to go to the game tonight? Well, I reckon I will. It's just you anticipate it, you expect it, that's just what you believe it to be so. So we're looking at Christian reckoning tonight. Now, there are two types of reckoning in the Bible, two types of words that are used in the translated reckoning. The first one is not the topic for tonight, but it's one we must touch on. And the first topic, idea of reckoning tonight, is the reckoning of giving an account. Of giving an account. Because we will give an account. There is a reckoning coming where God's going to come and give an account, and we'll give an account, rather, of what, are, what we've done for Him. In Matthew 25, 19, it says, And after a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. In other words, that kind of reckoning is giving an account. Here's what I gave you, I'm going to reckon with what you did with it. Here's what I told you, I'm going to reckon with you and see how you responded to that. That reckoning, that giving an account. Boy, ladies and gentlemen, if that doesn't stir us, if that doesn't keep us on the track, if that doesn't put our mind in focus to make sure we're doing right, nothing will. The fact that we will give an account. There is a reckoning coming. You know, these two quotes are not in your notes, so you need to listen to them. But as I read them and followed, found them, Boy, it stirs my heart. This is exactly that kind of reckoning when we will give an account. The old time preacher said, The reckoning of the soul before its maker is a solemn thing, a moment of truth unclouded by the veils of mortal life. In that hour the secrets of hearts are laid bare, and no pretense can withstand the piercing gaze of divine justice. It's a solemn thing to talk about we will give an account. We will give a reckoning to what we've done in this life. Another preach said, Let us not deceive ourselves into thinking that we can evade the consequences of our actions. The ledger of heaven is kept with meticulous precision. And on the day of reckoning, every entry will be accounted for. May we therefore live with integrity and humility, knowing that our eternal destiny and rewards hang in the balance. That ought to keep everything in perspective. That ought to help us challenge to be ready because we will have that kind of reckoning, that giving account to the Lord. And we hear that. We're, by the way, I'm glad God tells us we're going to give an account. I'm glad it's not going to be a surprise because He tells us that. So that's the kind of reckoning about giving account. But that's not the reckoning we have tonight. That's not the reckoning of this message tonight. The reckoning we have tonight, as we look at the words reckoning through these scriptures, it means to take an inventory. It means to estimate. It means to give an account of. It means to impute. It means to lay number. It means to reckon it to be so. So tonight's reckoning is idea of joy and power and victory, whatever it is, reckoning to be so. Now, as we look at these reckoning these things to be so, I want to help you with something. This is not I name it and I claim it. You know, there's a religion out there, there's a lot of people who says, no, you name it and you can claim it. No, but I tell you what, when God names it, we can claim it. Are you listening to me? That's what we're seeing tonight. When God names it, when God says this is so, and this is what it is, then I can reckon it to be so in my life. When God says this is what I promise, I can reckon it to be so. And so I'm just going to put it down as so, I'm going to put it down as right, I'm going to put it down as true, and I'm going to live based upon what God says. So it's not my, claim, my naming it and claiming it, it's His naming it and me claiming it based upon that tonight. What a difference that will make, what joy that will come, what power in my life, what victory it brings, as I just reckon it to be so. You say, preacher, but I don't feel it. You don't have to feel it, you just have to reckon it. You say, but preacher, I don't see it. We don't have to see it, we just have to reckon it, because it is of faith. So tonight we're looking at just about 450 verses 
not that many, just some ideas about Christian reckoning. So that when we leave here, you say, well, I know how I'm going to live. I'm going to live it just reckoning what God has said to be so. So looking tonight, first of all, at the Savior's reckoning. The Savior's reckoning. Just checking it off was like the picture shows there. I'm just claiming it as so. I'm just checking it off as being right and as so. And we just read that verse, as we see there in Luke twenty two thirty seven 37, about Christ, the Savior's reckoning. Jesus said in Luke, or Luke twenty two thirty seven, For I say unto you, that this that is written must be yet accomplished in me. He said, this is what's written about me, and it must be accomplished in me. And he, speaking about himself, but from prophecy, was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Again, it's taking an inventory. It's making an estimate. It's laying the truth to it. He says he was reckoned. He was counted among. He was estimated in transgressors. You begin thinking about that. God, the most holy of all beings we can imagine, was counted, reckoned in with transgressors. He did not sin. He was not a transgressor, but he was reckoned with the transgressors. He was laid inside with the transgressors. Aren't you glad he was reckoned with us transgressors? Aren't you glad he came and was reckoned with us? He said, I've got to be accounted with them. I've got to be involved in them. I've got to be accountable with them. The transgressors, so our Savior's reckoning, again, he was reckoned among the transgressors. Where would we be if he was not reckoned with the transgressors? I'll tell you where, we'd be in hell. We'd be in hell if he was not willing to be reckoned, accounted with the transgressors. Yeah, when we understand that, that he was reckoned to be with the transgressors, how in the world can we think He does not care about us? We have all kinds of troubles. We have difficulties. We lose our jobs. We lose our houses. We lose our health. And somehow we think God doesn't care. No, He was reckoned with us. We know He loves us. We know He cares and watches over us. How in the world can we think He does not know what's best for us? How can we think He will not strengthen me? How can we think He will not love on me? How can, he, how can we think He will not even serve us? As the Bible talks about in that day, He'll lay aside His garments and serve us. What a wonderful thing that he was reckoned with the transgressors. You say, what does that mean? First of all, it means the cross. It means there on the cross. We know the story of the cross. Two transgressors, two thieves, one on each side. One got saved, one was not. But here he was, the God of the universe, creator of heaven and earth, being reckoned, being accounted there on that hill with the transgressors. What an, even that's just an amazing picture. An amazing picture that God would not just die for us, but then be numbered, be accounted, be reckoned with those transgressors there on the cross of Calvary. Oh, I'm glad He went to the cross, and there He was reckoned with us. But it's not just in the cross He was reckoned with transgressors, reckoned with sinners, but in conception, in conceptions. When He took on flesh, He was reckoned with the transgressors. He, it's, it's an amazing thing that God would take on the appearance, similar sinful flesh. Again, I'm making it clear, he did not sin, but he took on that flesh that looks like human flesh. In Hebrews 2.16, it says, For verily he, that is Christ, took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't come as an angel. He didn't come looking like an angel. He didn't come in the power of an angel. No, he did not come in the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on that transgressor's skin, if you will. He took on that transgressor's life, on him the seed of angel Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, is able to succor them that are tempted. Again, in Romans 8, 3, it says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In his conception, he came reckoning among the transgressors. He said, I will take on human flesh. I would take on that flesh and dwell among them so that I can die for them. So in his conception, he was reckoned with the transgressors. That means he was reckoned for the transgressors for temptation. 
for temptation, that he would suffer temptation. Even that is an amazing thing, that God would allow himself to be tempted of the devil and tempted in the flesh, because he had flesh just like you and I did. He was numbered, he was reckoned then with the transgressors. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So in conception, he was numbered with us transgressors, so he could show us how to conquer temptation so he would be able to be that high priest that he would be able to succor those that are tempted but not only that in conception he was reckoned with us transgressors for emotional distress for emotional distress some of us don't like to acknowledge that people have emotional distresses i'm not going to ask if you're emotionally distressed tonight no i'm not going to ask that but these emotional distresses. I'm talking about where our emotions just swell up in us, where the pressures are just so much. I'm glad Christ was numbered with the transgressors, reckoned with the transgressors in conception for temptation, but also to help us with the emotional distresses there in your notes, Matthew 20, 26, 38. And he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly, exceeding sorrowful even unto death. I mean, that's our Savior. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. In other words, he was identifying with our emotional stresses. He was going through this. Yes, he was getting ready to go to the cross to experience things we cannot imagine, but still he was reckoned, accounted with, checked off with us as transgressors so that he could then succor us when we go through emotional distress. You say, preacher, I'm just going crazy. That's all right. Jesus Christ has been there. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was reckoned with the transgressors so he could then help us or succor us when we go through it. In Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, I've been under some emotional stress. You've probably been under emotional stress but none of us have been to the place where we wept and we prayed and we sweated blood but he did he was then reckoned with the transgressors incarnation so in this flesh he could do suffer that emotional distress so he could succor, succor us also human frailty human frailty can you imagine having a god trying to serve a god and trying to pray to god and trust a god who we would think has no idea what it's like to get tired, who has no idea what it's like to suffer pain, who has no idea. We have one who was reckoned with the transgressors in his conception, so he would know our frailty. John, 30, John 11, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. John 19, 20, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished there on the cross, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. John 4, 6, he was wearied and sat on the well. There, while he's carrying the cross, after he was beaten, in Luke 23, 26, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus started, but he was, just couldn't do it. He just did not have the strength. He was at that physically drained that they put it on Simon. His just human frailty. He was reckoned with the transgressors. God who did not have to do that. God who did not have to experience. He said, no, I want to be reckoned. I want to be accounted. I want to be part of that so that I can understand and so I can help those when they have human frailties. You say, preacher, I just physically can't go on anymore. Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. He knows whether you can or cannot. But also for loneliness and betrayal and rejection. You know, we get betrayed many times. We get let down many times. But so has our Savior as He was reckoned, as He was accounted among the transgressors. In Matthew 26, 56, all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, that all the disciples forsook him and fled. Wow. Boy, he was reckoned with the transgressors, reckoned with us sinners, so that he would understand about the idea of being betrayed, being lonely, and being rejected. John 1, 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Wow. Our Savior's reckoning. He was then reckoned as a, with the transgressors, reckoned, counted with us, dwelt among us on the cross and in conception. But not only that, but in communion. In communion. That He would be in communion and fellowship with us sinners. <laughs> see, the problem is we don't see ourselves 
as he sees us. We don't see ourselves as being that bad. Preaching in the class this morning about being the natural man and the carnal, carnal man and the spiritual man. As I said in the class, nobody thinks of themselves as carnal. Nobody does. How are you doing? Boy, I'm just living the carnal life. No, nobody wants to say that. They're all, boy, I'm spiritual and fine. But we compare ourselves to Christ. We are carnal. We are sinful. And he was then reckoned with transgressors and so he could spend communion with us. Luke 15, 1 and 2. And drew nigh unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. I don't know about you, but I want to say glory to God. I'm glad that he, this man, received sinners. He was reckoned with the transgressors. He was reckoned with the sinners so he could have that communion. He received with them. Boy, if he didn't receive sinners, nobody could be received. But he received sinners. I'm glad he was reckoned for transgressors and eateth with them. By the way, I'm glad he likes to eat. I'm glad he's allowed us to eat. Well, I'm looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, what a wonderful thing. Are you understanding tonight that Christ was reckoned? He was accounted us transgressors. Why? So he could have communion with us. So he could have fellowship with us. In Matthew 9, 10, And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eatest your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, that they may behold, that they be that that they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But you go and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Oh, he was reckoned for communion. I'm glad he wants to spend time with us now. I'm glad he'll spend time with you tonight and tomorrow. Boy, don't flee from him. Don't just avoid him. Don't just ignore him. He was reckoned with the transgressors. They have that communion. We won't read it, but we know about Zacchaeus. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He is gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Well, I'm glad he'll come into our house. If he was not willing to be reckoned with transgressors, he would not come into your house. He couldn't even come to the church because we are such sinners. But I'm glad he does. So tonight we see the Savior's reckoning. Praise God for His reckoning. Reckon Himself among the transgressors. Amen. I'm glad He did. Number two, we find salvation's reckoning. You say, preacher, what am I going to do with my Savior? Just realize He reckoned Himself with us. But we see salvation's reckoning. I'm glad. Well, let's look at it. Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision or upon the uncircumcision? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. I'm glad salvation is reckoned to us. I'm glad it's just accounted to us. I'm glad it's just given to us. What a glorious thing. This reckoning, just kind of just check it off. You say, preacher, I I don't feel saved all the time. Just, if you've trusted Christ, just reckon it to be so. Just count it off to be so. Just claim it to be so. Not because you're naming it and claiming it, because God names it, and so we can claim it. We find in that passage that salvation's reckoning is grace and not debt. Amen. It's grace and not debt. Look again at verse number four. Now to him that worketh, in other words, if you're working for your salvation, if you're working to be accepted of God, the reward is not reckoned, it's not accounted of grace, but of debt. In other words, if I'm working for salvation and I somehow work to be saved, then that salvation is not of grace. It's not God's unmerited favor. It's a debt God owes me. See, when people say, well, I'm working for it. I'm trying to get saved. They're saying, God owes me salvation. God owes me eternal life. Why? Because I've done this. Why? Because I'm living a good life. Why? Because I go to church. Why? Because I give money. God owes me salvation. How many understand that's a lie right from the pit? He does not owe me salvation. It's by God's grace He does it. And so it's just reckon. It's just reckon. So if you're struggling with security of the believer, just reckon it to be so. Just count it to be so. God named it and we can claim it. So God's reckoning of salvation is grace and not debt. It's a gift, not reward. It's a gift, not reward. Oh, I'm glad that we are saved by the gift and grace of God. Amen. It's not reward. I did not earn it. It's faith and not works. It's faith and not works. 
not by works of righteousness we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. So God's, our salvation is just reckoned to us. So here's the key. Get your salvation right, not on what you say, but what God says, and then just reckon it to be so. When the devil comes and says, you couldn't be saved and do that, you say, no, I'm reckoning my salvation because I'm not working for it. It is a gift. It's grace, not debt. It's a gift, not reward. It's faith and not works. Then just get it right and stay right. Oh, people say, well, I struggle so much about my security. Get it settled and just reckon it to be so. But I don't feel it. Just reckon it to be so. But I don't have that feeling inside. Just reckon it to be so. Salvation's reckoning. So we've got the Savior's reckoning. I'm glad He reckoned with us transgressors. <laughs> he wants to live with us and take us to heaven. But also we've got salvation's reckoning. Very quickly, I want you to notice sanctification's reckoning. Sanctification's reckoning. We talk about sanctification a lot, but here's the key. You just reckon it to be so. Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon, count it so. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. I'm almost going to preach a whole message. Wanted, dead and alive. Not dead or alive, dead and alive. That's what God wants from us, to be dead and alive. And that's what sanctification is. We reckon ourselves dead and alive. We just count it so that we are dead and alive. Being dead to the flesh. Oh my, that's what it talks about. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So I just need to reckon myself dead to the flesh. I'm just dead in the flesh. And so when the flesh shows up and the devil shows up and calls me and orders me, I can say, no way, I don't have to listen to you. I do not have to obey you. And that's what it says. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. While you're in the military, you're just a buck private, and the sergeant comes along, he can tell you to do anything, anything, and you have to do whatever he says, whenever he says it, however he wants it done. By the way, mamas, when your boy or girl signs up for the military, that's what they're signing up for, to be told exactly what to do, when to do it, and just exactly how it is. And so I spent ten and a half years in the Navy. Many of you folks have spent in the military and are in the military. That's how it is. You are told what you must do, and you can't. You can argue briefly before you find yourself in trouble. But you're just told. Sergeant comes, says, "Do this," and you must do that. And for years, that's how it is. For years, he calls. Matter of fact, you show up on a new base. You never saw this fella, but he's got one extra stripe, so he can come tell you what to do. But then the day comes when they hand you a little piece of paper discharge. You walk out of that office, discharge paper in hands. Free, finally, free indeed. That same sergeant comes over and says, I want you to dig that ditch. Now. Oh, okay. No, you say, no, 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 no. I am free. You can't tell me that anymore. See, when we are dead to sin and the devil comes and he says, you've got to do this, we'd say, no, 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 I am dead to the flesh. I am dead to you. I do not have to listen to you anymore. I don't have to obey you anymore. I don't have to fear you anymore. Likewise, reckon yourselves also be dead unto, unto, unto sin, but alive unto God. You want victory over the devil? You need to reckon yourself dead. Reckon yourself dead in the flesh. Reckon yourself dead to the flesh. Just claim it so. Well, how can it be? God says it. He named it so we can then claim it. So when I reckon myself dead, I can then let Christ live in me. When I reckon myself dead, then I am free to let Christ live in me. Galatians 2.20. Stay with me. This is so important. So simple. So simple. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. It means I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's a life of faith, he in me. So when I reckon myself dead, I can then let Christ live in me. 
Do you realize what a difference our life would be if we're letting Christ live in us? My life is dead. My life is gone. This old flesh is dead, but He's alive in me. I guarantee you, it'll be so much different in your Christian life when you reckon yourself dead unto the flesh, but alive unto God. See, preacher, I have trouble going soul winning. I have trouble being birth. Whoa, not if you're dead to the flesh and Christ is living inside of you. You say, well, I don't know about this giving and tithing. Well, it doesn't make any difference. When you're dead to the flesh and He's living inside of you, wow, it's going to be a different thing about giving, ministering to others. When we reckon ourselves dead, I can then let Christ live in me. But as long as I'm living, it's going to be hard for Christ to live in me. Because there's two of us. I need to be dead so He can live in me. Very quickly, when I reckon myself dead, I can then have my life hid in Christ. A life hid in Christ. Colossians 3.3 3. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When I'm dead and I die to the flesh my life is hid in Jesus Christ. Hid from who? Hid from the devil. Hid from the world. Hid. I'm, hi I'm in Him. I'm in Him. But as long as I'm alive, I'm a target. When as long as I'm alive, I'm not hid. But I'm being dead. I am hid in Christ, providing protection from Satan and attacks of the world and hurts of the world and being all discouraged. Well, I'm my life. But when I'm dead, when I reckon myself dead, I can yield these dead members to the, to serve in righteousness. As long as I am dead and I reckon myself that way, I just declare myself that way, I can yield these dead members to serve in righteousness. Notice in your notes, Romans 6, 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Preacher, how in the world can I yield my body, yield my members, these things that I've got here, unto God for His righteousness? Because I just reckon myself to be dead. So I'm dead, now I can serve and now I can give my dead members to serve in righteousness. Are you understanding tonight what a powerful thing that is to reckon ourselves dead and alive, dead to sin, dead to the flesh, but alive unto God. Very quickly, when I reckon myself dead, I can walk in newness of life. When I reckon myself dead, I can walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we must also, we should also walk in newness of life. When I reckon myself dead, when I claim myself dead, but alive to God, then I can walk in this new life, new joys, new interests, new habits, new loves. But as long as I'm alive in this old flesh, and as long as I'm keeping myself alive and not reckoning it to be dead to sin and to the flesh, then I'm going to have trouble still wanting my old joys, my old habits, my old wants, my old temptations, my old loves. But when I reckon myself dead, I can walk in newness. I don't have to live in that old life. No going back to the dead. No going back to the dead. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? To serve the living God. Well, I just need to reckon myself dead and be dead to those old works in the flesh and alive unto God. Wanted dead and alive. Here's the problem. As Christians, we go ahead and get dead sometimes, but we're not alive. I'll crucify the flesh. All right, I won't drink. I won't booze. I won't cuss. I'll make sure I do this. But we're not then reckoning ourselves alive unto God. What a miserable existence just to be dead but to be dead to the flesh, but alive to God. That's sanctification's reckoning. Just God named it. We just claim it. We reckon it to be so. So when the devil comes, you say, no, I'm reckoning myself dead. When this old flesh says, I want it, whoop, nope, 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 I'm reckoning it. I'm claiming you dead. Very quickly, notice suffering's reckoning. Suffering's reckoning will be done. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon, count it so, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering's reckoning is glory. Just glory. I reckon the suffering is nothing, but rather glory in it. 
2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So if I'm suffering persecution, it brings glory at the end. If I'm suffering worldly loss, I get glory at the end. Again, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Preacher, I'm suffering. Reckon it glory. Reckon it glory. Well, how can I do that? Because God said it. I cannot picture standing before Christ. I cannot picture the suffering of this world, God rewarding me or giving me glory or being able to glorify God in that. But God says I can. God says I will. God says He will glorify me with Him when I suffer in this world. So I just need to reckon it. You say, preacher, I need a 42-week class on how to suffer. No, we just reckon it glory. So when the devil comes and the world comes and persecution may come and we may find ourselves in jail, we might find ourselves uh, beheaded, we might find ourselves in all kinds of trouble, but for the cause of Christ, we can just reckon it then glory. So tonight, just Christian reckoning. It's, again, it's not I name it and claim it. He names it. I claim it. I just reckon it to be so. It's as simple as that. But preacher, I don't feel it. Reckon it to be so. I don't see how it's going to be. Just reckon it to be so. But I don't, no, no, just Reckon it. Just, it's just faith and obedience. You say, preacher, that makes it simple. Yeah, it is. It is. Reckoning. Reckoning. For our salvation, we're just reckoning it so. He paid the price. Am I suffering? Just reckoning it so. Just claiming it that way. Reckoning. For sanctification, just reckoning myself dead. I'm just claiming it. I'm just accounting it that way. I'm just checking it off. I reckon it is. What is it you need to reckon tonight? It's just faith. God says it, so I just reckon it so. And then live based upon what He says. Let's bow our heads, please.